This review was made possible by the Yojo Outlet Center, specializing in vintage G.I. Joe toys and parts. Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, the White Sumo's Forum BX257, here to bring you another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. And today I'm going to be taking a look at the G.I. Joe's first drone vehicle, the 1988 RPV, or Remote Piloted Vehicle. Now, I know a lot of people tend to think of this as a missile launcher because of this great big thing on the top here, and that's all right, but it is actually a drone vehicle. Unfortunately, it makes no comic book or cartoon appearances, which probably adds to the confusion. The RPV is a small tracked vehicle. As a matter of fact, a lot of its width is actually contributed by the operator seat being attached to the side of the vehicle rather than being integrated into the main body. Just to uh, give you a size comparison, here is a 1985 Armadillo, which is pretty much the same size, really. Again, the RPV's width is deceptively larger simply because the uh, seat is on the outside there. But they are very close in size. As for features, the RPV has one seat for an operator, as well as a seat belt. So there are slots in there for both ends of the seat belt, and you can just put a regular figure in there. I've always found these uh, seat belts to be a little bit hard to get on, especially in these cramped spaces. Seat belts were only on 1988 through mid-1989 vehicles. I can kind of see why they got rid of them. On the side here, we do have a control joystick, and another one on top here, which is a little bit difficult for a figure to reach over, and I'm not entirely sure whether it's meant for a figure sitting in the operator seat to be holding that joystick, but that's something we'll explore a little bit later. We also have a removable radar tracking pod. As you can see, this thing is attached right near the operator by this standard 6-inch G.I. Joe wire. It is attached right there by this little uh, plug there. And as you can see, it has fake tracks. There are no wheels whatsoever, but with the fake tracks, you can just assume that this thing moves around by itself. It's not supposed to be a robot, I don't think. It's probably supposed to be remote controlled by the operator. It's uh, not really specified as to why it has tracks on there, but the, um, the radar dish does spin around quite freely. Again, the uh, six inch wire just attaches right by the foot of the operator seat. And then we have the star of the RPV the actual drone rocket. It's made up of several pieces, but only one piece is supposed to be removable here, and that is the nose cone. So you pop it off, and you can see some extra detail revealed once the nose cone is off. Now the rocket actually stands on this railing. And the railing, while it is kind of kind of looser here, it's not supposed to be movable. The railing is fixed in this particular angle. And you'll notice it does have a very strange cutout in the middle here. And that's so that the this bottom portion, this red bottom portion, actually slips in underneath that area. Like this. And that's kind of what locks it into place, so it doesn't kind of slide backwards or forward or kind of uh, wiggle off. I suppose if you wanted to, you could take off this bottom rocket here. Just so you could pretend this was a two-stage rocket, I suppose. The RPV has solid tracks, which do not move. Underneath, we have these dummy wheels, which are, well, quite frankly, I don't like the fact that they're in bright red. But you don't see them at all. They are very well hidden from most angles, and it does roll really well. On the back, we have a tow hook, as well as a very narrow platform. 
This is the type of platform which would normally be used for figures, but it doesn't have any foot pegs, which is very odd. Now you'll notice that without the rocket, and well without the tracking pod, this thing is very bare, has no weapons whatsoever. It is basically just a tracked vehicle, which is really good for having a uh, tow hook on there, so now it is a towing vehicle. While that may sound a little bit boring, you'll have to admit there aren't very many desert colored vehicles here, so this is your one desert colored towing vehicle here. And here I have the RPV set up as a desert towing vehicle with the 1987 road towed hauling a 1985 ammo dump crate. But if you don't want that, you can always put some little desert vehicles and accessories on there instead. And if you're wondering, without the actual drone rocket, you can actually put some regular large rockets on there and turn that into a legitimate rocket firing missile vehicle. Now just putting everything right back into place. Oh, as a matter of fact, I'll just show you this real quick. That the portion where you where you put the tracking pod on actually does have some ridges right here, which line up with the treads on the bottom of the tracking pod, so it does hold in there really well and doesn't slide backwards into the to this cavity, which I'm guessing is an engine bay of some type. It's uh doesn't look like an engine, but whatever. And what I meant to say was, it's very odd that the back portion just doesn't have foot pegs, because that's where you would expect them to be. Instead, they're on the front here. One right there, and one right there. So instead, we have a figure potentially just kind of chilling out right in front of the driver position. Which I always thought was really dumb. But then I thought about something. That's um, That's not really where you're supposed to... Like, it is where you're supposed to put the figure, but that's not really the purpose of putting it right there. I think the purpose of actually putting the figures there is not for a ride-along, but to actually face the rocket so that you can have them displayed as if they're either repairing the rocket or programming it or programming the radar tracking pod. And while I have these two particular figures out, you notice a lot of collectors actually display the RPV with the 1988 hardball figure, simply because he has these uh, sort of light brown pants and a white shirt and tiny little bits of red, which really go well with the color scheme of the RPV, I must admit, as well as him being the operator on the box cover art. But, one thing I've noticed is that um, here I have a 1988 Charbroil figure, and I think he goes equally well. I mean, sure, the silver kind of stands out a little bit, but let's face it, this is a non-covered operator seat, so a little bit of armor is always very helpful in this situation, and I think he looks pretty good there. And one thing I did want to note is the that rear joystick. I'm, I'm still not really sure whether the operator is supposed to hold on to that or not because it is kind of a far reach. Uh, it's very odd sim simply because it's very near for the, the one that's actually on the seat. But I can imagine someone operating the uh, RPV launch mechanism separately from driving it. So it is actually reachable if the figure is just actually just standing right behind the vehicle. And it is certainly easy for it to hold on to. So if you're worried about the figure um, you know, being actually on the platform, which is a little too narrow for the figure's feet, but it's certainly more stable if he's actually holding on to that. The RPV may have been G.I. Joe's first drone, better known today as an unmanned aerial vehicle. But it wasn't the first in the series. It seems Cobra was really into that sort of thing. So the first one actually goes to the 1984 Claw, Covert Light Aerial Weapon. Well, you put a figure in there, you could also put a bomb in there, and this thing would just be its own separate remote or programmed vehicle.
Another interesting take on that whole thing is the 1985 Trouble Bubble, better known as the Cobra Flight Pod, where you can put the aerial mine again in the seat where the figure would normally go. One interesting thing I discovered is that the hollow portion here, while not designed as such, can act as storage for any of your driver's particular accessories, which of course might not fit on him while he's sitting in the operator's seat. Like Charboil here, you just put the backpack and his weapons in there. Even his hose fits in there quite well. And it doesn't uh, mess around with the operation of the vehicle. And here's the fan favorite Hardball. And his accessories fit in that little gap just fine as well. The RPV isn't a very popular vehicle on the aftermarket. So you can find one for fairly cheap. The problem is finding one which is intact. This thing is very, very fragile and breaks at multiple points on the vehicle. First, we'll take a look at the drone rocket. And the wings, they seem rather sturdy, but they break off very cleanly, in fact. The other extremely vulnerable part is, of course, the pegs, both on the tracking pod there as well as on the seat there. These are almost always broken off. And the worst thing is, is that in photographs, it's very hard to see whether or not they're intact. I know uh, some people have even gone so far as to say not to worry about that. And if they're cracked off, just drill a hole, which is wide enough for the uh, wire to go into. And you're good on either the seat or the tracking pod, or maybe both that they're both cracked off. Well, I don't know. Um, I do have to be uh, a completist here and say that you should probably try and find one with the um, peg on there, but it is quite vulnerable. So don't fool around with the uh, with the connection here. Don't don't try to strain it or anything like that. It uh, it won't end very well. Of course, you also have the joystick on the top here, which mine is, is actually uh, fairly, uh, fairly stressed, fairly, fairly stressed amount of plastic there. So that's another thing which can crack off. And one thing that is very easy to lose is, of course, the seat belt, which I know a lot of people just don't put the seatbelt in there at all because, well, it doesn't really need it. But at least the seat belt is fairly easy to find by itself on the aftermarket. It is a standard mold, so all the 1988 and 1989 vehicles which had the seat belt are the same exact seat belt, so you don't have to worry there. If the light brown desert color scheme isn't what you fancy, there is actually a color variant which is very drastically different. It was released in Europe only, but it is equally easy to find, believe it or not. As you can see, the body of the vehicle is gray, with the white parts now dark blue. Oh, while some people might argue that this looks a bit like Cobra, I would actually have to argue and say that this thing looks a bit like Battle Force 2000. Actually being separate um, and the tracking sitting 
or standing. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.